Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talked to Alan Freestone. Alan served in the British military before later pursuing a second career as a homeopathic medicine practitioner, specializing in treating children with autism. Alan is an avid Bitcoiner and we discuss everything from medicine to money to government and the open source future. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. So, Alan, I wanted to have a conversation with you because I uh, have been following you on Twitter for a little while, and as a fellow Bitcoiner, uh, I think you could have some interesting insights from the kind of Bitcoin angle on everything that's that's going on today. But before we get onto that topic, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and, and what you do. Okay. Hi, Johnny. Nice to speak to you. So I've pro- I'm probably coming from a, a different angle than, the, than a lot of people. So I started in the Air Force as an engineer, and then I left and now I have a second career as a homeopath. Uh, and I specialize in treating kids with autism. I've seen over 1,600 cases now, uh, and I'm quite well known within that niche niche subject. And then the, 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 the Bitcoin thing has come along sort of in parallel, but, but I, think there's a, I think there's a link between those things. I th- yeah, it's interesting that you say that because there seems to be quite a lot of Bitcoiners who are into the homeopathic type medicine. Uh, which I didn't know about until relatively recently, but it seems um, that I found out that either they're currently into homeopathy or or maybe they previously were before um, getting into Bitcoin. So it definitely does seem to be some consistency there. So just going back to your military days, what did you say you did in the military? Electronic engineer. So at the end, I was uh, working in a, a satellite strategic comms base. So it was like a big underground bunker with giant uh, satellite dishes outside it. Uh, and I was working in there in, on September the 11th. And we, we had all these big screens on the wall. So we were basically making sure all the, the circuits for whoever was uh, overseas <clears throat> killing brown people. Um, we were basically making sure their comms was, was working uh, and all the uh, the ships and all the rest of it. So we were like, it was like a, like a Dr. Evil underground lair with these big TV screens on the wall watching the the planes crash into the, the World Trade Center. After that was kind of my starting to be red pilled, <laughs> I think. Um, and and the after the uh, the sort of drum beats and the and the Afghanistan thing and the Iraq War thing coming in the on the the tail of that. I remember I was not very busy one day and I uh, I sat and I read the dossier. I don't know if you remember. You're younger than me, but the, the they had the, the dodgy dossier that proved that Saddam was ready to launch um, missiles within 45 minutes. And I read it. It was about 50 pages long or something. And I read it. And uh, at the end of it, I was like, "This is a load of shit. There's there's nothing here whatsoever. There's no evidence. This is nonsense. How can they be?" And then it turned out they had just. Uh, they had like copy and pasted it from some students' um, notes they had found online. Absolutely criminal. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that was the beginning of my of my. Maybe we're not the goodies. You know. The, <laughs> you know the meme. Yeah, I'd never heard that before. Is that true? They actually copied it from a student essay. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a PhD student or a master's student. Yeah. Yeah. There was big chunks of it copy and pasted. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember, it's a long time ago, but I just remember it was not very well written. It didn't read as an authoritative document at all. It was like, come on guys, you know? (laughs) Okay. So when you talked about your, your red pill moment there, are you referring specifically to that you think that there's how far do you go down with that kind of thinking in terms of like the 9-11 stuff? Like, do you think that there's legitimacy to the idea that it was known about before the attack happened or where's your thinking on that? I don't think you even need to go that far. Uh, no, at the time, no, I was not thinking that. It was just our, I say our, as in Western government's responses to it. It was just uh, horrific. Uh, and we're just sort of getting to the the tail end of that 20 years later with the absolute debacle of the Americans 
leaving $85 billion worth of, of hardware in, in Afghanistan as they just they just left one day. It was, it's a most bizarre episode of history. I don't know what they're going to be, how they're going to analyse it in 100 years. But yeah, as far as going down deeper in that rabbit hole and it being an inside job and things, I've certainly watched the um, James Corbett um, documentaries on that. And yeah, I'm open to anything at this point. There's definitely anomalies, you know, and some of it would be disputed, but even the stuff that's not disputed is just weird. Like the the the, the um, Obama members of the, sorry, Obama, <laughs> what was his name? Um, Osama bin Laden. Uh, bin Laden's family were actually in America at the time, and the, the Americans had them shuttled and sent, sent away in a private jet. Like the, the next day, it was so many peculiar things. Or I suppose it's a bit like the, the COVID thing now something will be in the news and then suddenly it doesn't make sense anymore or more evidence comes up or something like that. And it's never discussed again, like the the aircraft crashing into the Pentagon that, that, that doesn't seem to have been an aircraft that seems just to have disappeared. Uh, it's it's just, just not mentioned anymore. That's it. It's just <laughs> Yeah, it seems to me, because I, I had a similar thing with the 9-11 stuff relatively early on. Um, I was quite young when it happened, but I would say a few years later than that, maybe when I was in my kind of early teens, I got really into the whole 9-11 stuff and quite deep into the conspiracy um, ideas. But then I moved away from them quite a lot, to be honest. And the main reason for that was because I thought, well, how could this ever happen? You know, that we would know about it. How could they get away with something like this, etc.? And I would say that more recently, mm. I've kind of come back to the idea that there might have been some validity to it because now I'm unwilling to throw something out purely on the basis of, well, that would be too big of a lie because now that I've witnessed everything going on with COVID, suddenly I'm like, well, actually, there is no such thing as a lie that's that's too big because um, I've seen how the world can be kind of bamboozled by the covid propaganda and yeah. the lies that have been told around this and now i'm very much open again to the idea that a lot of those things that i used to believe about 9 11 which i moved away from not based upon the evidence changing but more based upon my own uh, interpretation of what could be considered truth and what could be considered a lie has shifted in this whole period yeah and another angle to look at it is let's assume it is an inside job what are you going to do about it you know, I think so many people can go down the conspiracy rabbit hole of different things and end up sort of lost down there being the crazy guy at the party that uh, is just stuck in this in this loop. OK, OK, let's say it was, let's say the Americans were involved and planned it up. So what are you going to do with that information? <laughs> that's, that's the interesting thing to me. You know, there's no point in wasting your life chasing conspiracy theories you know and, there, and there's lots of people that are there yeah. i totally agree with that yeah I, i've definitely felt like i was you know watching all of these videos and reading stuff and you know communicating with other people and kind of the whole 9 11 truth movement it seemed to get really big and then die out and it was exactly as you said it never really was destined to be some kind of success because i don't know how you would define success if you're expecting people to go and get arrested based on this evidence when there wasn't even a court case um brought and the chances of that happening are just almost non-existent well to, to even have a court case brought you have to be you still have to have faith in some part of the system being just you know <laughs> yeah that's that that's exactly that's exactly what i was trying to get at you're you're relying on the tools of the system which mm. you're claiming to be completely corrupt so yeah that is a, a good way to segue onto Bitcoin, but I actually want to just um, pause on the Bitcoin stuff for now and just get into the homeopathy. So what brought sure. you to homeopathy? Uh, when did you get into that? Weirdly, I was a weird teenager. I, I like to read. <laughs> uh, something my teenage daughter doesn't do anymore. It's all TikTok and bloody uh, Instagram. But uh, I found the, the, it, there's a book called The Organon of Medicine, which was the the guy that founded homeopathy 200 and something years ago, uh, it was his sort of a guidebook. Here's homeopathy. Here's how it works. And I found it in my school um, library back when I don't know, was 15 or 16 or something. And I read this and you read the first page and well, I read the first page and I was like, Oh, 
this is this guy, <laughs> this guy's got it. Uh, and I and I just thought, right, I want to be a homeopath. That sounds right to me. Which seems so funny because it's been so maligned, especially in the UK. It's it's so maligned and sort of put along with astrology and I don't know. Um, <clears throat> candles and crystals and stuff but actually the guy was a hard minded scientist he, he he was he was inventing the scientific method his he was his guidebook for pharmacists and how pharmacists should um the correct way to run a pharmacy and how to keep things uh pure and uh, you know um, things like that that was still in use in the early 20th century that his, his, he, he was the, he was telling the pharmacists how to do their job because they were a, a terrible. This was about 1805 or something. They were absolutely terrible. It was all the, the things that they were giving out weren't pure and, you know, all sorts of problems. And he invented the, the, the uh, double blind, um, you know, testing you know, RCTs, which uh, people say, oh, homeopathy is not uh, scientific. He bloody invented the thing. But uh, <clears throat> so I carried this book with me. But then I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to I want to go and have some adventures first. So, yeah, so I ended up in the Air Force. But I, but I always had the because I still thought we were the goodies. But <laughs> but I always had the uh, the idea that I was going to come back and I was going to do homeopathy when, you know, when I was older. And then. I ended up leaving the Air Force, but I, I stayed as a as a civilian contractor and um, for a few years, <laughs> not not killing anybody, but as a, as an engineer, civilian contractor, and uh, <clears throat> and then at that point, I thought, right, this is my opportunity, and I I started doing a a degree in my spare time in homeopathy. So I finally graduated from that in two thousand and nine. You can do a degree in homeopathy. You could, but the the well organised people that that have been on homeopathy steel for the last 20 years i think they uh they have badgered it so that, that it's no longer available but when i uh, was doing it uh the university of middlesex was accrediting the um the homeopathic college that i was at so you could get the homeopathic uh, qualification and also a bachelor of science which i think is brilliant because it, <laughs> it must really annoy lots of people <laughs> i've got a bachelor of science and we have it's not science uh yeah 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 because i um at one point i went to get um oh, what's it called where you it i had it on my shoulder it was almost like when they kind of like they maneuver it for, for kind of what's the what's the name of this osteopathy of, or i think what? that's it Osteo Os uh -huh. osteopath yeah an osteopath uh -huh. And I, I had an osteopath who had come from Italy and he said that when he practiced in Italy, he was practicing it illegally because it was actually banned there. You actually can't yeah. have a practice. Italy are quite, quite tight. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which I just found crazy. I mean, it was it was quite good. The treatment was quite good. But I give a lot of credit to homeopathic medicine. Personally, for me, I've just had a lot of positive experience, particularly with acupuncture and cupping therapy which all probably would be under this umbrella of woo science according to um you know more of the kind of allopathic medicine um practitioners well it's it's so it's funny how it leads into bitcoin but also into the covid thing where the stuff that i was shouting about for years people in the freedom movement are now realizing about uh, Pfizer or or these other pharmaceutical companies manipulating uh, data or bribing uh, medical journals or um, uh, bribing the media or politicians. And I'm like, yeah, we've been saying this for 15 years, but finally I think a wider audience are now getting that, uh, that, oh, maybe homeopathy and other alternative things, maybe they've been deliberately maligned by the same people that are busy maligning you know treatments for effective treatments for for covid now you know yeah the way that i kind of view all of this is that there seems to be an effect that ha occurs whereby you take one red pill and it seems to cascade into a load of others it's almost like water dripping into a bucket and once it gets to a certain amount the bucket tips over and everything comes out at once because it, it seems that the people who have seen the the covid lies which to me is probably it's the low-hanging fruit really it's the low-hanging fruit in the kind of trying to assess truth in the world yeah and when people cling on to or they let go of 
falsehoods. A lot of other falsehoods seem to be kind of dropping away with that as well. And one of them seems to be this kind of dogmatic belief in allopathic medicine, which I certainly think, I don't know whether I necessarily agree with all claims of homeopathic medicine, but there certainly seems to be a lot that are very obvious and quite self-evident to me, which would be considered to be, um, you know, woo science by the establishment. I think part of the, basically there's a narrative, I think, in medicine where, uh, we'll get to Bitcoin, I'm sure, but uh, where <laughs> there was nothing effective whatsoever and until, basically until the end of the Second World War when antibiotics came along. And since then, we have scientific medicine. And before that, it wasn't effective. It was just, it was just quackery. And it's absolute nonsense. There, there's been effective um medicine for thousands of years but it's the narrative has been so twisted at the moment that this is that would be that would you know if you ask the Stephen Fry's or the you know the cultural um spokes people that are allowed on tv nowadays uh that would be the that would be the dogma if you if you questioned them enough you would get to it basically there was nothing before antibiotics it was all it was all nonsense i i went to the um uh the science museum a few years ago and there's a there's a floor in it, the history of medicine floor <laughs> i was the only person in it and i thought i was in the wrong place because it was all empty and dark but you can see these, these they've got these old cuneiform stone tablet things from four and a half b thousand bc you know crazy crazy old things that we probably shouldn't have and uh but you and with translations and there it's the same herbs that, that homeopaths are using today and they were using then they knew you know ipecac is a is a, a herb that's really good for uh well it induces vomiting basically uh they were using it then homeopaths use it now to stop vomiting it, it, you know, it's there were effective things in the, you know in the past or i was you know hms victory done in portsmouth the, the, the nelson's flagship from the battle of trafalgar there was a a segment on the all the injuries and things that were sustained, because you imagine the cannonballs flying through wooden ships and splinters flying everywhere and infection. Well, no antibiotics, so they must have all been dying off left, right, and center. No, nope, their survival rate was really, really high, far higher than it should have been if the dogma of now was was correct. You know, most of them that got these infections, they recovered. Um, so, so yeah, you've got me on a rant. How did they survive? A good point gunpowder is a you can use gunpowder as an like an antibiotic type it's not really it's not a, it's not living but it's a, as a antibiotic type thing so maybe they knew that like in the first world war the, the soldiers that were shot in no man's land you couldn't go and get them because you would get shot so they would be they would be lying there and then at dark the medics would try and crawl out and try and drag them back and they were using gunpowder on their on their wounds to stop infection so it was known then uh, that gunpowder would have helped. So maybe it was no one in the in the uh, uh, during the Battle of Trafalgar. I, you know, I'm not sure. Wow, that's uh, that's really interesting. Let's. Um, well, yeah. Let me ask one more question on that. So, what kind of homeopathic medicine is it that you do personally? So I'm trained as a homeopath, a classical homeopath, but I do a lot of detox homeopathy. So. There's a brand name called Cease Therapy. It's a bit obscure, but it, it's basically saying that a lot of, so I specialize in autism and there's been an explosion, again, the narrative doesn't agree with this, but the, there's been an explosion in autism. It's ridiculous. My mom's a, a retired nurse. You speak to retired nurses or, or retired school teachers. There was not even the slightest number of kids with developmental delays and sort of autism symptoms around back, you know, decades ago. It has just skyrocketed. So you can't say it's genetic. It, it can't be genetic. You don't get a skyrocketing genetic thing. It has to be an environmental cause. So this section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship free platforms. If they step out of line, especially an NHS doctor, if you become the, oh, you're the, he's the anti-vaccine guy, it's your career finished. So you, you have to have a certain, I don't know if you know that um, uh, Noam Chomsky interview with a, from years ago with the, with the uh, British journalist, I've forgotten his name, 
Uh, you, you know the one I mean? The, sort of the, yeah, was, the it, was it Krishna Guru Murphy or? No, 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 no. One? It was older, older than that. Mar, I think it's Andrew Mar. Oh, was it? Uh, yeah, and he was saying, uh, I, I don't, I'm not manipulating things. I don't, and Chomsky said, no, no, I believe it. You you believe that, of course. But the only reason you're there is because you believe that. You're. It's The people in those positions have been filtered. They, they've, they know how to not say anything controversial and to sort of toe the line. And I think it's the same with the medics. They, 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 you just can't, you'll, you'll be, and you can see it with the guy, um, you know, the, the MMR guy, Wakefield, Andrew Wakefield, and, and how the, the hatchet job they did on his reputation. And they'll go out, they go after your reputation. I've, I've been, there's been about three hatchet jobs on me where they've, the, the Telegraph have had some woman in, in this room uh, as a fake patient, uh, was it two years ago? Uh, trying to, trying to, get me to implicate myself i had the who else was somebody else was the times of the times i had i think i've had three three of them and the manipulation so it was a video it was actually a video she took a hidden video in her handbag and uh she used like this out of context one minute of or 30 seconds of me saying something so she was basically saying should i have my child vaccinated and and, and i had already been through that well it's up to you it's not for me to to advise you. You have to look at the the and make your own decision. Do, 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 do. And then she was like probing and probing and probing. And then she uses the you know the little snippet where I said, "Well, if it was me, no, I wouldn't do it." You know. <laughs> uh, right, and and she's there to ask your opinion on it. If you don't want someone's opinion on it, like what? Why even bother asking them? It seems to me that even if even if she had have said, "Should I get my child vaccinated?" and you said, "Well, look, if it was me, I wouldn't do it." Like what? That that's kind of what she would be there for anyway. It seems like a very weird hit job. If that was a hit job, it is a weird hit job. And and luckily, the well, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, but also in this country, we are seen as lay a lay person. So I have no, I have no uh, under law. I have no medical expertise above you. So it means they, they they could go after a GP or a nurse or something like that and have them struck off and ruin their careers. What you, what can you strike me off from? There's no, I'm not on anything, so <laughs> we're kind of, which is it's kind of a, a back to the sort of Bitcoin thing. It's it's I'm uncancel I'm uncancelable to some degree. Of course, you could cancel me from uh, social media and things, and then it would be harder for me to reach people. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you brought it back to Bitcoin because uh, I feel like we could stay on that topic forever. It's it's actually really interesting. But let's get on to Bitcoin for a bit. Um, when did you find Bitcoin? What was your kind of uh, orange pill moment? Years ago, and I didn't buy any. So there was a friend of mine. I was I had moved to London. I, I was working in London, and I was a new homeopath. And I didn't have two pennies to rub together. I was trying to build my practice and basically living. And <laughs> my overdraft was getting worse and worse each month. Um, but I had a friend. Uh, from Czech Republic, and um, and for some reason there's a there's a real link between Bitcoin and Czech Republic people, and he was and he was involved in the Occupy London uh, thing, and uh, and I think it was shortly after that that he was he started talking about Bitcoin, and before I knew it he had his, he had these miners in his flat and he was doing all these things, and uh, at one point they had ASIC miners un, like under like cardboard in their garden and you could just hear this wow. <laughs> as you walked into his flat he was he was adamant he was like this is really important this is and i was kind of interested but i didn't get it there was no alex gladstein's there was no alan farrington's there was no breed loves or breed clouds so, uh but i but i i i even said to him at the time it's like i find this really interesting from sort of a philosophical economic point of view he was up to his eyeballs in the tech of it and I, I was less interested in that i was more interested in this as a tool and it's only really in the last two or three years that we we finally have uh deep thinkers and i suppose the the with the um uh, the bitcoin standard coming out as well it, it's only in that recently that we have a sort of philosophical underpinnings i think for this stuff so i think it was 2015 or 16, I had started buying some, I started buying at about $600. That was about $600 when I started. And, and I was buying for a few months 
And then I started mining ETH because I, I, I didn't know about shit coins in those days. So I started mining ETH and I was mining one a, a week. It was only it was, it was only a, a like a quite a low powered um, graphics card, but it was doing about one a week. <clears throat> and then it, gradually the difficulty started ramping up. And eventually it was like one every two or three weeks. And I turned the thing off. <laughs> if only I had kept, if only I had kept going. Uh, and then I started reading. There was there's there some guy, and I can't remember his name, uh, big tall guy, and he just looks like a hedge fund manager. And he he wrote a book about crypto assets. And uh, and I had a history of, of personal finance and investing and and value investing and you know Warren Buffett stuff and you know things like that. Uh, so I was partial to this. So this book was arguing that you need to build a balanced crypto portfolio. So I disappeared into that for several years of attempting to to build it. Well, you need a <clears throat> you need Bitcoin, then you need a platform. You know that, that they're going to build DApps on. So you want Ether or EOS. Uh, you know I got heavily involved in that. And you want uh, you want a privacy coin, and you want da, 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 da. and I I think I would already be wealthy living on a tropical island somewhere if I had just stuck with Bitcoin from them from the beginning. But I think everybody probably goes through that. Uh, that learning stage. And also at the beginning, I didn't have conviction. It's, it, it, I think it's one of these things that gradually your conviction hardens over the years you're in it until it just becomes the, you know, they talk about diamond hands, but it just becomes this, yeah, that's it. And nothing else, just, you know, just this sell your pension. It doesn't matter. Just, you know, but it's, but I think it's a process and sometimes a painful process of, of uh of getting to that you know until you sort of laugh at the downturns or well when you get these downturns i just i tend to buy more of that so that's the <laughs> that's the stage I'm i had a similar experience i got into bitcoin in 2016 as well and then kind of descended down the the kind of sh- into the shit coinery stuff and <laughs> was in that for a little while and so common what were, what were you what were you into Oh, I think it was, I mean, Litecoin was probably the first one, Ethereum. Because it made sure. sense, it made sense, didn't it? You've got gold and you've got silver and th- these are smaller so you can use them for easier transactions. It made sense, you know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the this, these ideas, are, they make sense when you're quite early into it and you haven't really fully understood economics and you haven't fully understood the technology yeah. and the way that these things are being built and even the game theory and, and things like that. So. Yeah. I, I forgive everyone for going down the shitcoin um, rabbit hole, but eventually I came back to Bitcoin and really, I think it was early 2020 when things the market started picking up that I didn't really care much about my shitcoins. They were just there. I just wasn't really doing much with them. Everything was just sat there. And in the end, I was like, I'm just going to put it all into Bitcoin and YOLO in. And like you said, um, your conviction definitely does grow over time. Uh, a lot yeah. of people think when I when I tell them, oh, you know, I was buying Bitcoin, I think I was in a little bit, probably a little bit later than you. I think it was about $700 or $750 when I bought my first Bitcoin. Well, it must be very close because it was ramping up. Yeah. I, I bought it at 600 and then the next one was more and then the next one was more and, you know, it went up to over 1000 Exactly. And people, people kind of think now oh, well, you know, you must be done buying, right? Because, you know, you bought a fraction of the current price. It's like, well, no, 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 I'm putting more in than ever. I'm exactly the same. I'm exactly the same. Yeah. I was only trickling stuff in because I didn't trust it. I didn't know what it was. I was, I was just inching in. And, and we were already quite far on, on the, quite far on the field of sort of being reckless, let's say. But even doing that, you know. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, as things get crazier in the traditional finance system and as you lose confidence in it, that also becomes easier. So it's almost like you've got this dual effect of getting more conviction in Bitcoin as time goes on and also having less confidence in the traditional system. And that just compounds. And over time, in the end, it's almost like everyone just ends up um, almost all in this thing because presuming you don't sell, it's growing as a part of your portfolio. And you know, some people would say, oh, well, you know, you need to, to sell and diversify into something else. But, you know, as Sailor says, selling Bitcoin to, to put it in something else and the price goes up to diversify, that's just selling your winners to buy your losers. You know, you want to do yeah. the opposite. A smart investor who has conviction in what they're buying will sell their losers to buy their winners. But also, but it's more than that. It's not like being a smart investor in the stock market because it's it's they're destroying the fiat base. So why the hell would you sell 
this to, it would be different if you I don't know you owned Google and it had soared you had made he had made millions okay I'll go back to dollars again and buy some but you wouldn't even think about doing that with Bitcoin because you know the dollars are going to zero yeah and just to compare it to what we were talking about before with other things where you kind of implicitly know it's true but you're battling against a system which is very good at hiding it right so you know for instance you were saying about the um the homeopathy stuff and the the vaccine injuries and, and this kind of connection which you implicitly recognize and you're saying okay well doctors probably to some degree recognize it as well and see these signs but it's very difficult for everybody to have a barometer on that and to know whether that's truth because there's so many other forces at play it's kind of easy to suppress whereas with bitcoin something like that is very hard to suppress because you see this price going up and that is your indicator of the truth there so where you've got people like it's a Steve signal to, it's a sing, exactly yeah. it's a signal to noise ratio again back to my engineering days but it's such a it's such a profound thing it's like there's your signal this thing you know when christine lagarde is squawking about printing some more trillions of euros and then we take another jump it's like there's your signal you know it's, it's yeah <laughs> don't deny it and it's like the it's almost like the kind of you're seeing the economic effect of truth it's like if you can put if you can put these two systems side by side well let's see which one grows and you see the bitcoin price going up that raises some some eyebrows and people say okay well why is that happening? Well, that is just the market telling you that all of these fiat economists are wrong. All these people who are saying that this is, you know, just criminal money and this, that, the other have just been proven wrong purely by the price. You just look at the price. And but, I, but I think most people don't have that yet because you're sort of, you have to be right back down to first principles and thinking about that as a signal. My mum was talking, my mum my mom has Bitcoin. Uh, uh, right. My mum was talking to my aunt the other the other week uh, back in Ireland and uh, the aunt, so they're very, they're very middle class, well-educated ex, you know, former sort of school, retired like school teachers and things. And uh, they were basically given the, <clears throat> whatever the Guardian says about Bitcoin, it was just like, that was their opinion on it. And my mum just repeated that to me and I was just laughing going, that's where we are with the, they're not even, they're not looking at first principles or what could be wrong with fiat or anything like that. They're just, they're still just repeating the the nonsense. It's a tulip, it's a, for scammers, it's for, you know. Exactly. And this, I think, is why Bitcoin is such an important tool and why I want more people in this movement to kind of be on board with that. Because, you know, what Bitcoin ultimately is doing is people who are aligning with pure truths and who are recognizing that this thing um, is for real and this thing means something and is an incredibly powerful tool they're getting in now and it's kind of like the laggards i don't you know i used to kind of worry about really trying to bring in um the laggards but now i just want a certain type of person in bitcoin i don't really care if everyone gets in right now i kind of want more time for myself to stack and i want more time for other people who share my philosophy to stack but yeah. honestly like people who who aren't in and who are still listening to the news and they're still you know listening to you know just idiots um tell them that bitcoin's worthless and they're believing it well, you know, they're missing a massive, massive economic opportunity. But the beauty of Bitcoin is that, you know, economic pull factors are probably the most powerful force that we have. You know, we live under a system of capitalism. Um, you know, some people might wish that we didn't, but, you know, we do. And that's a natural um, way that humans have organized themselves. You know, like, yeah. sorry, sorry, <laughs> socialist, communist, whatever. But this is this is the way it is. And um, that economic pull factor is going to naturally bring people into it. So it's almost like it's almost like people are being drawn to the truth through an economic effect in a way that has never happened with ever, anything else. And that is the most powerful force that you can imagine in a society. Yeah. And I think I, I have friends and they worry about uh, it's unjust and, oh, you, you're rich, so you can buy loads of Bitcoin now and then you'll get even richer. And what about that per person in Uganda that kind of... But Bitcoin's going to bring in a more just world so it's Bitcoin's going to benefit that person in Uganda, whether they get in now or, or don't get in now. So even these people in in the movement that don't buy now and wait, Bitcoin's coming and and they will end up benefiting from it in the future. They'll lose out on the potential massive gains of as Bitcoinization happens and the fiat currencies fall away, but they're still going to benefit from it. Exactly. It is going to create a better world and a fairer world for everyone. But you know, my belief is that it's not only, it, it's not like 
an unfortunate fact of Bitcoin that some people are getting really rich on it early. Actually, you know, what Bitcoin really is doing is rewarding early adopters for, for being willing to bet on a fairer system and to build a fairer system. And to take risks. Yeah, and to take risks, exactly. And it's almost like this, this perfect um, system, this economic system, which says, hey, we're, we're having a financial uh, revolution. We're going to completely um, take, out, take money out of the hands of government and create a fairer world where people can actually store their value and people can't be robbed by governments and um, you know, these are the malign forces. Um, if you get in earlier and you you put, it's almost like you can have a stake in that revolution. You can buy Bitcoin now, and you're gonna and you can keep it and you can hodl and you can do all of these things. And you have to have conviction and you have to have this strength of character. And Bitcoin will kind of test you through all of this stuff. And then it sort of the, molds. It's, it kind of molds your character. I think it's completely. like I say, people about building a, pra, a business, a small business. It changes who you are for the better. It changes who you are. It's a bit like somebody that's built a million pound business and lost it all. Far easier for them to build another million pound business than somebody else starting from zero because they've already been honed and, and strengthened by the by the previous process. But it's a, just just holding Bitcoin is a character building experience. exercise. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And it, it's almost that this is precisely what's needed because. You know, my belief is that Bitcoin is going to be, or that Bitcoiners are going to be the builders of the next kind of epoch of human civilization, because fiat is going to zero, and there is going to be something which takes over. And my belief is the only candidate for that is Bitcoin. And actually, this whole kind of idea of you know hard times, um, oh, yeah. you know, build build strong <laughs> men. This is kind of what we're we're coming into now, which is that we're in the hard times. And in my view, the, the strong people that you want to build the next epoch, they've found Bitcoin or they are finding Bitcoin because they're saying, you know what, I have the conviction to move away from the system. I'm going to take things into my own hand. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of uh, regain my own sovereignty. And they're going into Bitcoin. And what I love about this revolution is not only that it's creating a fairer world, but the people who are going to have benefited the most and who are going to have the most power, actually the people you want. Because, you know, politicians, yeah. we can no, all it's kind not of bureaucrats. It's not, it's not exactly. people that have yeah. got to their position in the NHS hierarchy of admin, admin managers by playing office politics because they will naturally side with... Uh, with with fiat stuff and cautious approach and all the rest of it they're not they're not the crazy mavericks that will be out creating stuff exactly and and it almost seems as if we've got this really polarized world right now where i look kind of out at the fiat world and it's just a complete inversion of everything we see in Bitcoin. You know, we see the worst people who are holding the positions as as politicians. They don't have any philosophy. They don't have conviction. They they're complete cowards. They just buckle to whatever the media does. They have no consequences for their actions. Absolutely. You know, they're snakes. They're liars, and all of this kind of stuff. And Bitcoin selects for people who have the opposite characteristics. Bitcoin selects for you know the kind of the people who have strong conviction, the people who want fairness in the world, the people who are willing to take risks, the people who are willing to speak the truth and stand up for what they believe in. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it's going to change things so drastically, in my view. And that is probably something that's kept me positive through all of this is when the rest of the world is burning to the ground. I see the Bitcoin world like a, an amazing oasis of, you know, ideas. And, you know, I really see it as almost like a renaissance that's happening. I agree. I, I think it would be I would be depressed and probably on my third bottle of wine by now today. If if we were going through the whole COVID horrendous WEF lockdown, New World Order, pod people, insect eating, you know, all that crap without Bitcoin, it would be dark. It would be a dark place. Whereas whereas when you're a Bitcoiner, you see you kind of see it like the other way around. It's like, oh, this is the end. This is your system's about to collapse. This is you're getting desperate here. You know that it's kind of, you can you can just you it's the same stuff you're looking at but you can just your perspective can be totally different because you can you can see it's all being built on nonsense that, you know yeah absolutely yeah like will the police will the police be for, like that was another thing i i'm a fairly law-abiding <laughs> citizen and and i sort of even though i i would say oh i've been red pill for a year i still would have faith in that so i was going to the protests last year in london and Watching the behaviour of the Met Police, that was one of the last things to be stripped away. It was like, oh my God, I, it was appalling. It was absolutely appalling. I had a, 
we went to one of the ones in Hyde Park. I don't know if you went to any of them, but in my group was this a retired pediatrician, this this very well spoken lady, and she went up to one of the uh, she went up to one of the uh, police constables. And she was like, oh, what's going on today? She didn't look like a protester. She was just dressed in like, you know, whatever. <laughs> Marks and Spencer's blouse, whatever it was. And he was like, oh, there's a far right protest today. That, that's why there's so many police here. And I was like, oh, wow. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. But, but also watching how they provoked, they were trying to provoke trouble rather than, you know, diffuse things, diffuse things. They, they, were, they were trying to create conflict with the, with the, riot, uh, the riot police. It was it was. It was eye-opening seeing that, you know. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Some of my experiences at these protests have been, you know, just another one of my many red pills through this whole thing is when I see yeah. the police now like I'd never seen them before. I always believe that they would have some kind of restraint. I, I genuinely see the police now as just complete operatives uh, for the state. They are just protectors exactly. of the status quo. They're oppressors of the people. And, you know, I'm sorry. Exactly. I'm sure and I, 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 I resisted that. I was like, no, no, because... And I have friends that are police that are in the police. <laughs> totally. <laughs> She's a Bitcoiner, by the way. <laughs> but uh, she wouldn't have been, been like that. But you sort of, yeah, it's exactly it. They're, they're, once you, you have to switch and you go, oh, you're an agent of the state. Your, your job is to, is to maintain the state's power. That's it. It's not about investigating the burglary or stopping the assault or whatever. It's, it's, about, it's all about protecting the state once you get that it's like oh wow you're my enemy <laughs> Almost, you know. yeah it's actually it is actually quite simple um but what i find interesting and just to bring this back around to the the bitcoin idea is that a lot of people who i find who are bitcoiners who have kind of walked away from their jobs that they didn't agree with um you know for, for moral reasons they've been able to do that because they were they got into bitcoin and I find that another really interesting thing, because sometimes I wonder, how are these police who, you know, presumably there's a lot of them who are looking around and saying, I'm just an agent of the state. I am literally oppressing my friends and my family and, you know, making the world a worse, worse place. And I'm just defending yeah. this establishment. Sometimes yeah. I wonder, well, how are they going to come to a situation where they're able to walk away from that? And the way that I see that happening is by them finding Bitcoin, because I'm sure that if you had a, a, a police officer that's in this community and has spent enough time in, in it and has allowed Bitcoin to change them like it changes so many people and also revolutionize their their finances and give them a, an opportunity to walk away from it, then they would walk away from it because um, it's just one of the many freedoms that it gives you and, you know, that the Bitcoin actually offers to the individual. It's cool. It's kind of this old idea of fuck you money. <clears throat> I, I, I'm assuming I can curse on your yeah. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in the past, that was, oh, three months wages or something like that. But in the era of Bitcoin, fuck you, money could be, uh, I never need to work again in my life. What it, you know, what's the, it's, 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 that's, a, that's a rare freedom that is suddenly going to be offered to so many people that just seemed inconceivable. It's, you know, again, we've, we're all running on these narratives that are turning out to be fake. But this narrative of, oh, you work 40 years, then you get this pension and did did no, the pension's going to be worthless, and but you, there's another, there's an opportunity here to to be free and then choose what you want to do rather than doing that thing that you know is harming people or the earth because you need the money. Suddenly, you can be free to, you know what? I'm going to replant fifty acres of oak forest or something like that. You know, something positive because you no longer need to be chasing the fiat, you know, dragon. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things which I would love to see is all of these people who are getting fired from their jobs, uh, you know, the care workers in particular and soon to be the NHS staff, is yeah. I'd love to see a campaign where they all just say, OK, um, you're going to fire me. I'm going to just take loads of my um, I'm going to take whatever whatever package. Presumably they have to be paid some kind of redundancy package. Uh, out of that. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how that works, but they just take the whole lot and put it into Bitcoin. Because if everyone does that, they can kind of scratch each other's backs in a way. Because um, if if a hundred thousand people all go and take their Pulls entire the price up and benefits all of them, pre yeah, yeah, precisely, yeah. And, and they put their and you know, and they they it would be a incredible kind of gesture, really, by these people. And but this is another thing that people need to make that connection that Bitcoin is there to kind of act as a, not not necessarily a safety net, but it's on the side of freedom, you know, for all of these, these groups who are being oppressed in various ways, there is one single um, thing which can help everyone. 
my my observation with crypto the crypto space is often we are contrarian and we're red pilled and we've gone down the rabbit holes. I think sometimes people, because they're like that, they go so far that way that they end up contrarian beyond Bitcoin and say, well, if it's got that big, it must be because it's um, started by the NSA or it's controlled or they can shut it down. So I'm going off to this shitcoin. I've, I've met so many people like that. And it's like, oh no, you're, it's almost like, they're um, sabotaging. I, I think it is. I think it's some form of self-sabotage thing going on where they're going to end up holding some shit coin that will be trending to zero when yeah. they just needed to stop there. That's it. It's just, it's digital gold. You're good. You, you don't need to keep going to, you know. Yeah, I've seen the exact same thing and I've seen it happen time and time again. I remember when I was kind of in my semi shitcoin phase where I still paid some attention, you know, first of all, it was, oh, you know, Bitcoin's not private enough. We'll use Zcash. And then it was Zcash isn't private yeah. enough. We'll use Monero. And now the thing is like pirate chain. That's what everyone's talking about. It's all about pirate chain. It's like, you're just going to keep going round and round in circles and eventually you'll find yourself back at Bitcoin. So, you know, don't just screw yourself over, just get in Bitcoin now and just relax. But I agree. It does seem like so many people think, oh, it's controlled and this, that and the other. And it's like, okay, just look at it technologically. This isn't like a question of, is it controlled? Like read yeah. the code, run your node and you know for absolute certain it's not controlled because you are running the software. Yeah. This isn't something where it's like, you know, it is it like you're you're running the software yourself. Like you can either read it yourself or you can take the opinions of other people who are developing it and other people who are reading it. But it's yeah. not like this can't be a this can't be a conspiracy. This can't be an NSA controlled thing. Like you're running the code. <laughs> yeah, I find that really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I I think of it. It's a bit like uh, again back to homeopathy, but I call homeopathy open source medicine. I keep saying I'm going to write a book called Open Source Medicine. That's great. I like that. I love the whole open source movement, and Bitcoin is it's an offshoot of that, isn't it? You can there was a there's a book I've read on sort of you know the the development of digital cash over the decades and how we've eventually because that's the other thing where they think oh it's just invented out of thin air. No, it was a iterations over over generations of things where gradually gradually we got to a Bitcoin that actually that actually works. But it's, yeah, as you say, it's open source, isn't it? So, but it's a bit like homeopathy. It's like, well, you can go and test it. This isn't a, it's not a, this is this, it's anti Pfizer. It's not, oh, we've done some, there's been some trials, but you're not allowed to see the results. It's, it's not that. It's like, well, go and test it yourself. That's, that's how you know. <laughs> yeah, precisely. All right. So just to kind of start rounding things up, this is something that I like to ask, particularly when someone is a Bitcoin, is because normally they have a, positive view of the future somewhat so where would you like to see things in in five years time a better world what's the kind of world that you envisage going forward citadels <laughs> i want to see i want to see or like an organic just sprouting of <clears throat> citadels in multiple places and i know some people have quite a, a that that old um bitcoin time traveler guy warning about citadels but i think the potentially really positive things. Yeah, so that's what I would like to see, where you have lots of different social experiments going on. I think we're going to be in a very different place. I just don't see how fiat can be surviving. I think there's going to be some really bad stuff happening in the next few years, but Bitcoin didn't cause it. Fiat caused it. Uh, <clears throat> but, but as with those things happening, I am hoping we're going to be seeing these sprouting... Um, citadels that are just going to be amazing you know i would love to see that a thousand different experiments so just for for people who aren't familiar with the kind of concept of citadels can you just break it down a little a citadel, so up until fairly recently there were city states in europe and these city states like the renaissance came from city states in northern italy that's where this explosion of uh, tech and creativity and things came from all based on hard, a uh, uh, hard monetary, uh, like gold. Was it? Wasn't sovereigns? I forgot what you call failures. Was it? I can't remember what you call them. But their their gold coin that persisted for hundreds and hundreds of years, and because of that, they were able to have uh, to build amazing things. So we are living in this time of nation states, and we assume again, it's another narrative. We assume that this has always been the case. It's actually a very recent development. So uh, citadels are just going back to this idea of of 
city states where you get a group of Bitcoiners together, 100 Bitcoiners decide to buy some land and you've organized with the local government or maybe the local government's collapsed, that you're going to be an autonomous city state. And that's it. That's that's a citadel. And some of them are going to, they're talking about being agricultural and all the rest of it. But I don't think that's even necessary. When you've got resources, you can buy an exchange with, I think somewhere like, I think like somewhere like Madagascar, somewhere that's never, it's never developed and it's never really worked. I, I think that could be a really good uh, synergistic thing where the citadel could be there and it could be benefiting the, the wider country around it helping the economy to grow rather than being an exploitive thing it will be this shining thing on the hill that that that, yeah 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 i totally agree with that i mean um i guess with the citadels concept it's like we're finally potentially going to have this opportunity to kind of break free of these structures because once money printing is out of the hands of government um and we have that ability ourselves there's absolutely zero chance in my book. It's a very, very basic mathematical equation that once you take money printing out of the hands of government and their ability to control its its supply and distribution, that almost um, all of uh, government as we see it today will collapse necessarily. And there's because it has to, as you say, it's mathematical. There's no, there's no way around that. It's like they could never, they could never have been in in Afghanistan for twenty years if not for money printing. Stop that, and yeah. But, but it, you watch it over since early 20th century and the creeping expansion of the government until it's like 50 or 60 percent of the of the entire economy of a, of a country that's only that's all built on them being able to print money stop that and suddenly that's just gonna have to go yep and that's how we get free all right I'll yeah. leave you just with the last words um thanks for me for coming on so much this has been a really really good conversation I feel like we could have gone for hours um but yeah any last words from yourself and if you just want to let people know where they can find you as well no last words i I, i've really enjoyed today thank you very much johnny uh yeah maybe we'll meet in person someday yeah but so my my name is alan freestone i don't disguise myself so my website's just my name.com you can find me there i'm also on twitter uh under my name again uh yeah (laughs) great thanks again so much All right. See you in the Citadels. (laughs) Thanks, Johnny.